uh, invite my panelists and speaker uh, to light the lamp. Uh, can we come down for a minute? Ashish, may I ask you to give your speech now, please? I'm sure at this audience you don't need uh, to be told who Ashish is. Bow down. <laughs> so, uh, good afternoon. Um, on behalf of BSC and the team, uh, let me extend a warm welcome to Professor uh, Colin Mayer, who is a Peter Moore's Professor of Management Studies at the Syed Business School, University of Oxford. I would also like to welcome Dr. Geeta Piramal, who is a renowned media personality, freelance writer, a book writer, a business historian, managing editor of the Smart Manager magazine, and many other things. It also gives me a great pleasure to invite or to welcome Sri Prasanth Jain, who is one of the biggest and most famous fund managers of our country and works with HDFC Mutual Fund House. Also welcome Sri Sandeep Parekh, who is a partner at FinSec Law Advisor and was an ex-executive director at SEBI in charge of legal department. A warm welcome to other dignitaries present today, including Nipun, at the International Convention Hall of BSE. Um, we are all gathered here and are keen to listen to the talk by Professor Mayer. This is the first time Professor Mayer has stepped foot into this International Convention Hall of BSE. It was not actually the Convention Hall, sir. This used to be the trading room. After automation, we call it euphemistically a Convention Hall. Uh, Professor Mayer, I would like to update you that this, this place has seen a huge amount of trading before. Um, and uh, post-digitization, it has been converted into a, a trading uh, in a convention hall. Most of you are aware that BSE was established uh, in 1875 as a native share and stock broker association, as opposed to British. It was a very, very nationalist, nationalist institution. Uh, until 1925, uh, only Indians were allowed to become members when Britishers were ruling. Uh, BSC's is a popular equity index, S&P, uh, BSC Sensex, um, is the most widely tracked stock market benchmark index by investors across the globe. It is traded internationally on the URAX, DGCX, and BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, China, and South Africa. Uh, BSC is the world's largest action in terms of number of listed companies, uh, which stands uh, at 5526. The nearest uh, large action is half our size. Recently, market cap of BS listed firm crossed landmark figure of rupees 100 lakh crore, which is first by any exchange. I would like to give you a brief background of uh, Professor Mayer. He's an expert on all aspects of corporate finance, governance, and taxation, and the regulation of financial institutions. He has consulted for numerous large firms and for governments, regulators, and international agencies around the world. Professor Mayer teaches the F elective course on mergers, acquisitions, and restructuring on uh, the MBA and the Master's in Financial Economics and the principles of financial regulations on the Master's in Law and Finance. Professor Mayer has served on the editorial boards of several leading academic journals 
and assisted in establishing prestigious networks of economics, law, and finance academics in Europe at the Center for Economic Policy Research and European Corporate Governance Institution. He was a founding editor of the Oxford Review of Economic Policy and a founding co-editor of the Review of Finance. So I, I want to stand uh, between you and him. Thank you very much for coming today. I appreciate it. Ashish, thank you very much for those very kind words. Uh, it's uh, very, very kind of you to invite me to be here, and it's a really great pleasure uh, to be able to talk to you today. I should just switch on my other microphone while I'm about it. Um, and thank you for the, for the kind words that you uh, said. Uh, my, uh, my father, if he was alive today, would have appreciated them. Uh, and my mother would have believed them. Because, uh, as, as, as Woody Allen said, uh, since light travels faster than sound, people appear bright until you hear them speak. Albert Einstein once said, many things we can count don't count. Many things we can't count count a lot. We can count share prices. We may be able to count CSR expenditures. We may not be able to measure human, natural, and social capital with ease. But human, natural, and social capital may count a lot, and share prices and measured CSR expenditures may count relatively little. Einstein might have added that things we can count should not be controlled. Where we cannot count, we need to commit. Even if we can count CSR expenditures, we should not necessarily require them. Even if we can measure share prices, we should not always seek to maximize them. Because the purpose of business is not to maximize profits. Profits are a product, not a purpose of business. The purpose of business is to do things, to make goods and services which benefit us as customers and communities. And in the process of making goods, it does good and it makes money. We're therefore starting from the wrong end in stating either that business should maximize profits or that it should spend a certain proportion of its profits on CSR. What we should be doing is to start from specifying what business should be doing. And companies themselves, their owners, their boards, should be doing that. They should specify what is the purpose of the corporation. Some will place a lot of emphasis on social responsibility programs. Others will not. Some will emphasize short-term profits and others long-term growth and prosperity. Some will emphasize short-term profits and others will emphasize the importance of pursuing other goals. Some will devote more than 2% of their profits to CSR, and some far less. The market will value them accordingly, and so will their customers, employees, and societies. The key is that companies should make clear where on that spectrum they lie, in whose interest are they being run, and do they have a purpose that goes beyond just making profits. And then they should commit to what they claim. They should have owners who are committed to delivering those purposes and support their firms in achieving them. They should have boards of companies that are responsible for upholding those principles and values and who are liable for the failure of them to do so. How does this differ from what we've got at present? 
The answer is fundamentally. At present, the sole purpose of corporations is to maximize shareholder value. That's not what corporate law says. Corporate law states that directors owe a fiduciary responsibility to the company, not just to its shareholders. And that is what was intended. But it's not what happens. Because corporate law is not what determines corporate practice. Corporate practice is dictated by owners and the market. And owners and the market dictate that shareholder interests are paramount. But it need not and should not be so. There's mounting evidence that companies that pursue long-term sustainable growth outperform companies that target short-term profits. That superior performance comes from stronger reputations, more trust, and a greater sense of community and purpose in companies that pursue sustainable long-term growth. And that allows those companies to achieve greater productivity and greater rates of return on that capital. Does that make them shareholder value-maximizing companies? Not a bit of it. The profits derive from the pursuit of product quality, service reliability, and employee welfare, not from the pursuit of profits as such. On the contrary, the pursuit of shareholder value is often inimical to those purposes. It drives companies to pay dividends that are inconsistent with our long-term investment requirements. It encourages them to engage in acquisitions that have disastrous consequences for their long-term performance. But equally disastrous, are attempts to achieve better outcomes through regulation. One cannot make companies ethical by regulation any more than one can make people moral through legislation. What is remarkable is the degree of convergence that is in the process of occurring around the world in understanding these points, starting from very different positions. In the Far East, in China, there's an understanding that there needs to be a greater focus on the interests of outside minority shareholders in mixed ownership rather than pure state-owned corporations. In Japan, there's an understanding that outside foreign institutional investors need to be encouraged alongside the dominant holdings by insiders in the hands of banks and companies. On the other side of the world, in the UK and in the US, there's an appreciation that the relentless drive to shareholder value maximization has been very destructive of both industry and society more generally. There, there is a growing realization that more emphasis needs to be placed on long-term sustainable growth, long-term as against short-term profits and well-being of stakeholders in the company in general. India is exceptionally well-placed to grasp this nettle. It has family ownership that can provide more stability and longer-term perspectives than in the UK or in the US. It has more domestic listed companies here on the Bombay Stock Exchange than on any other stock market in the world, twice that of the number of companies listed on the London Stock Exchange. But it's yet to grasp fully the fact that corporations can and should play a role in promoting the interests of Indian society more generally. There are many cases of where precisely this is happening. Tata is a prime example. The combination of family ownership and oversight of the companies by the trust has been one of if not the source of its remarkable success. And it's the reason why it's also been able to make successful acquisitions abroad of companies like Chorus, Jaguar, and Land Rover. Its strong sense of purpose and values allows it to delegate control down to international 
as well as domestic subsidiaries in a way in which many other companies cannot. India may be able to learn valuable lessons from this and other examples of success. Certainly we, in the Syed Business School in Oxford University, where I'm based, are seeking to do exactly that. We're seeking to establish a program of research and teaching on responsible leadership that will hopefully set the benchmark around the world. What we're trying to do is essentially to uh, establish what are the ways in which business can achieve outcomes that are superior, not just in terms of their financial performance, but in terms of their contribution to their stakeholders, their employees, their suppliers, communities, and society at large. We're seeking to understand what makes for good business, not just in the sense of maximizing profits, but in contributing to long-term prosperity and social, as well as economic well-being. We're partnering with some of the best corporations in the world in understanding precisely what they do, how they do it, and what is required for them to be able to achieve it. What is intended is a fundamental repositioning of our understanding of the corporation in modern society and how it can contribute to rather than destroy human, natural, and social capital, and how it can partner with rather than being an adversary of government and how ultimately we can reduce our dependence on the state to achieve social and public purposes. There are, I believe, three components that are emerging as being key to the successful, responsible business of the future. Those three components could be described as being the purpose of the corporation, its ownership, and its governance. Even companies that are listed on stock markets do not necessarily have to pursue shareholder interests. In a survey that was undertaken of middle management in five countries around the world, the UK, the US, France, Germany, and Japan, those middle management were asked the question, do you believe that your company is being run solely in the interest of its shareholders or in the interest of its stakeholders, such as its employees and societies more generally? In 70% of the UK and the US companies, the middle management gave the response that they thought that their companies were being run solely in the interests of their shareholders. In 40% of the French and German companies, they gave that response. And in just 3% of the Japanese firms. And those differences really matter because those same middle management were asked the question, in the event of your company getting into financial difficulty, do you believe that your firm would cut its dividends or cut employment. In 90% of the UK and the US firms, the middle management gave the response that they thought that their companies would cut employment. In 40% of the French and German companies, they gave that response. And in just 3% of the Japanese companies. It is not necessarily the case that even stock market listed companies need pursue solely their shareholder interests. But if they are to pursue any other objectives, then it's critical that the owners of the company are fully committed to the pursuit of those alternative objectives. It used to be the case that voting of shares on stock markets around the world was on the basis of one person, one vote, just as in political elections. 
But then it was realized that actually that's not terribly fair. Because if some shareholders invest a lot of money and hold a lot of shares in companies, they've committed more capital than shareholders who only buy one share in a company. So we moved over to the principle of one share, one vote. And that's regarded as being a fundamental principle of corporate law and the fair treatment of shareholders. But of course, it's not really fair at all. Because if some shareholders commit to hold their shares for several years or decades, then they're committing a lot more than shareholders who are only willing to hold their shares for a matter of days, hours, seconds, or in the case of high-frequency trading, nanoseconds. And so we can think about ways in which we can actually encourage shareholders to commit to long-term shareholdings. At the moment, shareholders can't, cannot even signal how long they wish to hold shares for in companies. What one could have are essentially shares which are registered shares where shareholders commit to hold for particular periods of time and receive votes that are proportionate to the period for which they are willing to hold those shares. Other shareholders who do not want to commit in that way can hold bearer shares that they can freely trade with lower voting rights or no voting rights attached to them. In essence, that's a form of dual-class shares, a dual-class share which encourages long-term ownership. Now, dual-class shares are observed around the world, including in India and even in the United States. So companies like Google, LinkedIn, and Facebook came to the stock market in the United States with dual-class shares that conferred more control on the founders of those companies like Sergey Brin, Larry Page, Eric Schmidt, Reid Hoffman, Mark Zuckerberg, than it did on the outside shareholders. And the reason that those owners gave, the founders gave, for wanting to have those controlling shareholders was to ensure that they could protect the purposes and values and the long-term goals of those companies. Jack Ma, when he listed uh, Alibaba, did not go to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange because it's got the same listing rules as those in London, which prohibit dual-class shares. So he went to the New York Stock Exchange. And Manchester United, Manchester United, had to list on the New York Stock Exchange when the Glazier family felt that they could not list it on the London Stock Exchange and retain control through dual-class shares. We have to recognize that it's important to be able to encourage diversity of ownership, and in particular, the presence of long-term owners that are committed to the long-term prosperity of their companies, and the mechanism I've described of relating votes to the period for which shareholders commit to hold shares is a way in which one can encourage shareholdings not just by families and founders, but by other investors that are willing to commit to the long-term, such as pension funds, and life insurance companies. But it's not just the owners that have to commit to the long-term prosperity of the company. So too do the people who are running those companies, the directors, the board of directors. Some of the most successful companies in the world are Bertelsmann, the media company, Carlsberg, the brewery, Bosch, the automotive supply company, Velux, the window manufacturer, Ikea, the furniture retailer. All of those have one thing in common with Tata. They are all owned by trusts or foundations. Now those trusts and foundations give a majority of the profits of the companies that they control to charity. But it's not that philanthropic element that I want to emphasize today. The more significant element is that the boards of those foundations are responsible for ensuring that the companies below them uphold the values and the principles of the founders so that they get perpetuated through the life of not just the current generation of owners, but future generations of owners as well. Now that combination 
of clearly articulated purposes, long-term committed owners, and independent boards of trustees that can uphold the values of those companies give rise to what I describe as being trust firms, firms that one can trust. Now, I'm not arguing that the governance of all companies should be like that or all should be the same. On the contrary, I argue that what we need to do is to seek diversity of ownership and control of companies. Because what is suited to a small, high-tech company is very different from a large, innovative company. What is suited to an innovative company is very different from a traditional manufacturing company. What is suited to a manufacturing company is very different from a service company. We need to encourage diversity of corporate form. Now, one can do that in many ways. But one way which is emerging as being particularly important in that regard is the emergence of what is sometimes termed the benefit corporation. The benefit corporation is a, is a mechanism of certifying that companies have purposes that go beyond the pursuit of just the profits of the firm. And one can go further. Stock exchanges can establish social stock exchanges. The London Stock Exchange is in the process of doing exactly that, that allows companies to list that have a clear social purpose and are validated as having uh, an appropriate public purpose. And one can go beyond that, as happens in the United States, where there are public benefit corporations now in 28 states in the United States, by which companies can incorporate as firms that have a public benefit and where the shareholders can sue the directors if they fail to uphold those public purposes. Those forms of diversity are extremely important, and regulation and excessive regulation can undermine the pursuit of that type of diversity. Now, we can go even further in encouraging companies to have a social objective through the tax system. We can tax companies that use or abuse social capital, human capital, and natural capital, such as our environment, and we can subsidize those that contribute and improve and invest in human, social, and natural capital. What this suggests is essentially a 10-point plan for addressing the problems associated with the corporation. That first of all, companies should take responsibility themselves for their own conduct and the consequences of that conduct and not simply go on doing things until someone tells them to stop doing those things. They should have clearly articulated purposes of in whose benefit is the company being run. They should have, often but not always, long-term committed owners that are committed to upholding those purposes. They should have independent boards that are responsible for ensuring that those purposes are upheld and providing the mechanism for measuring whether or not companies are actually abiding by the support of their human capital, social capital, and natural capital. We should have measures of accounting that incorporates those forms of capital. We should have regulation working alongside those objectives of companies. We should have tougher enforcement of whether abuses of public law, like bribery, corruption, market manipulation on stock markets, market abuses, or environmental degradation. We should have regulation that helps to protect our systems, to protect our financial systems and our environmental systems, which companies on their own cannot be expected to protect. But elsewhere, we should have less intrusive, less prescriptive regulation 
and instead we should look to corporate law as a way of encouraging more social emphasis by companies and enabling legislation, not restrictive regulation, to empower companies to operate in a diverse forms of ways in achieving those purposes. And we should start the process of educating the next generation of leaders and owners in what the purpose of the corporation is so that when they become chief executives and owners of firms, they are aware of their roles and responsibilities as well as their rights and rewards. And I want to end by illustrating how I believe that this approach sheds light on policy. The last few years have seen remarkable reform of corporate governance in India. The 2013 Companies Act, replacing the 1956 Act, which has remained on the statute for nearly 60 years, has been a major advance in terms of corporate governance. Together with new provisions introduced by SEBI, they are extensively improving the nature of corporate governance in India. In essence, what India has adopted is a form of corporate governance that was first put forward in the UK in the form of the Cadbury Committee, then enshrined in the Combined Code, and is now part of the UK Corporate Governance Code. But there are substantial differences, and it's important to understand the origins of those differences. First, the UK Corporate Governance Code is exactly that. It's a code, not UK company law. Secondly, while the UK listing authority requires companies to state their adherence to the code, it's on a comply or explain basis. It's not mandatory. Third, to the extent that this is a listing requirement rather than company law, it does not apply to private companies. But there are more fundamental differences. The UK Corporate Governance Code is in the context of a country where ownership is widely dispersed amongst a large number of predominantly institutional investors, such as pension funds, life insurance companies, and mutual funds. The main problem that corporate governance seeks to address in the UK is the agency one of ensuring that the interests of management are aligned with those of dispersed shareholders who individually have little incentive to monitor the companies in which they invest. The structure of ownership in India is fundamentally different. It's predominantly family and often families that retain control through many generations of family members. In Britain, we struggle to have family firms that survive for more than one, certainly two or three generations. They are often described as founded by fanatical fathers and inherited by squabbling siblings who work at play and play at work. In India, there isn't an agency problem because for the most part, there isn't a separation between ownership and control. On the contrary, the governance issues that arise in India are exactly the opposite. The risk of excessive engagement of family owners in the activities of the firm to their own benefit, but to the detriment of the firm and its other investors, what one might term private benefits. The role of independent directors is therefore much less to ensure that management acts in the interests of their owners and much more to ensure that they do not act against the interests of minority shareholders. In other words, it's more about minority shareholder protection than resolution of agency problems. And in that regard, it's actually closer to Scandinavian and Nordic country corporate governance than it is to the UK. There, there are large family shareholders and strong rules regarding minority investor protection. It works very well in those countries, and they are currently upheld as models of good corporate governance in the world. What facilitates its success there is recognition in Nordic society of the importance of equality and the importance of the fair treatment of different members of society. And it's important that that should be the context within which the corporate governance rules that are being introduced 
in India should operate as well if one is not to burden independent directors with a job of trying to manage the interests of, of dominant shareholders and minority shareholders effectively. But the 2013 Act seeks to go beyond the fair treatment of minority investors to the fair treatment of society more generally. It lays down not only minimum CSR expenditures, but lists of eligible forms of expenditures, and then makes the board responsible for them. This part of the Act is on a comply or explain basis. In that regard, the Indian model is actually closer to a Germanic than a Nordic or a UK model. Because in Germany, corporations are expected to reflect the interests of their stakeholders, such as their employees, as well as their shareholders. The question that this raises is whether, as India now seeks to give companies a social as well as a purely commercial purpose, this will require a significant change in the nature of the governance of Indian corporations, requiring essentially the separation between the monitoring and executive functions of the board exactly along the lines of what is observed in Germany with the coexistence of supervisory boards and management boards. If so, the trust model that I've described before may have particular relevance to India as it embarks on this journey of recognizing the responsibilities of corporations to society more generally. But irrespective of whether you buy into the trust model, the fundamental issue is, can we design our corporate and financial systems in such a way that companies and financial institutions themselves take responsibility for not just their founders, owners, and shareholders, but also their communities and nations? Or are we ultimately destined to be subject to the increasingly heavy hand of government and regulation as we have been to date in the post-financial crisis era? It's too early to answer these questions, but at least we in the Cyber Business School in Oxford are going to have a go at doing so, to see whether we can let many firms bloom to seed the source of both India's economic prosperity and its social well-being. You can count on us to count them in and at least have a go at doing this. Thank you very much indeed.